Hello, hello, and welcome to a rather noisy corner of the universe for a bit more of Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2. And we've been carrying on with the sort of the puzzle related stuff in the last stream, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about that a bit. But if you want to, if you want to try and avoid anything that's remotely spoilery, anything that's remotely puzzle related, then just skip forward a couple of chapters, because we're going to be talking about the Stargate first, then a bit about the pyramids, and then I'll get back onto normal sort of construction y stuff that's been happening here and there around the factory. And let's get started out in Fenestra because, well, it's a slightly silly place. Um, you, we've got the Stargate out here that we've been messing around with, and in the last stream, Mark went in and he put in some of these uh, these singularity reactors, and these take in these little matter-containing capsule things, and they're being passed around, and they're being, as you can see, gobbled up and put into these in, in, into the various singularity reactors, and they then produce large quantities of power. Now we don't seem to have quite enough of them for it to keep all of them running at the same time, so I'm going to nick some of the ones from there and put them in here instead. So we've now got all of the all of them kicked in. And you've got the usual problem here where, um, because they're a, a type of reactor, they use fuel all the time, even when their fuel isn't actually going anywhere. And because the Stargate saps rather a lot of power, as you've seen before, it takes 10 gigawatts just to run the thing. Uh, we've put in, well, we're trying to put in a switch over here, and, uh, okay, that hasn't quite happened yet, but we're, we're on the way to doing that. So if I link these two together like that, there we go. Now we can actually start using the power that we're pulling out of here. So you can see we've got, we've got 10 gig, well, we've got tw uh, 12 gigawatts being produced, and we're now using 10 gigawatts of it. And that's all flooding straight into the Stargate over here. And having given it power, we've got these symbols, the glyphs appearing all the way around the outside here. And then disappearing again as one of the machines shut down. Okay, we've run out of fuel cells, that's why. Okay, I've now fixed it. It was due to the uh, a bad arrangement of fuel cells mean that meant not enough of these things were running. So I've plugged it back in again now. And as you can see, there we go. Now we've got power to the uh, Stargate. We're getting all the glyphs appearing around the outside here. And these will all look very familiar to you. You've seen lots of these before when we were talking about the puzzles. Uh, some of them are some of them are quite familiar. Like there's the uh, the pi one down. There's a on its side there. There's a pi there. There's a sort of a, a pitchfork there. Guy with a sword and so on. And you know, we, we and there's there's a scorpion that we've seen lots of. Uh, we, we've we've given lots of these names. And so the and so these have all appeared. And we've got some buttons down at the bottom here. And I can poke these. And when I do, it rotates the symbols round like this. Um, and they just turn and turn and turn and turn, and then there's a stop button as well, so I can stop them. And it, okay, it takes a moment to stop, but then you could, I could run it backwards, I suppose. And yeah, there we go. So we can control which symbol appears in which one of these things. We also notice that we've now got one green light here on the anchors column. And this fits with our theory that because we put in a dimensional anchor here over in Kalidus orbit and powered it, and this can be just left powered because it's running off solar, so we want, now we've got the panels down, it's just a no-brainer, we can just ignore it. Uh, so because we've got this here, we've got the one green light in the anchor section over here on the Stargate, so that's good. We've also got the uh, temperature one, and we've put in pipes all the way around here for the, uh, for the thermofluid, and well that's... Um, there's nothing here, as you can see, there's no thermofluid here. We've only got, only got as far as putting the pipes in. So this is a, a work in progress, but we, we are assuming that once we start pumping in super chilled thermofluid into here and then to bring in the warm out, then we'll start to get these. As each one of these gets chilled down to the right temperature, we'll start to get some green lights coming on across here. The other thing we've noticed is these things, uh, these things um, with, the, with the target thing. Now, with the, um, with the movable components over here, I can press R, and that happens, and then we get an immediate short circuit, the power, and the power goes out. Um, because suddenly this, the system starts to take more power than we have available. Now we haven't actually worked out how much power that is that it requires, but you might have noticed that just as, I, as the thing was going across and just before it died, we did get a green light on down here. So these targets are the number of the, um, of the, of the, the, uh, the movable components around the outside that you have used to set the, um, set the glyphs on the Stargate. Um, we're going to have to now somehow try and kickstart this back into into um in, in, into what function again and it looks like one of the reactors over here has run out of fuel again there we go i've redistributed the fuel once again so now hopefully we should have about enough power to oh, no no got Unfortunately, keeping this thing running is a little bit awkward because we're in a sort of a, a funny edge case at the moment where the the, um, the, the the Stargate over here takes so much power that if, if these aren't all running, then the system fails and falls over. And all and when that happens, we then can't get enough power through here, which is why we have this switch in here is a ghost. So we can easily turn it on and off and make things behave themselves. But at the moment, we haven't got the switch here yet, so we're just going to have to grumble about it a bit. And you know what? I think we've seen everything we need to see over here, so I'll just carry on talking about it. 
about it instead of instead of showing it running. But at this point, we are we we have a few we have obviously some theories about this. So you can use the uh, the buttons at the bottom to rotate the glyphs around, and then you can use the uh, the the movable components to actually set them to to be on on a specific uh, part of the Stargate. So presumably, when we set all eight of them to be specific um, symbols, then we'll be then the Stargate will go womp, and we'll be able to do things. Now exactly what those things are going to be, we're not sure at this point. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the in the pyramid section in a moment because it relates more to that side of the puzzle than just getting the Stargate up and running. But we have a couple of ideas, but we don't really know which of those ideas are going to be true, what's exactly how it's going to work. We don't really know. It's, it's still a bit of a mystery. Down here in the power generation area, which has now completely failed, as you can clearly see. Uh, let's disconnect it again like that. So at least, well, we can... We can't, we can't even jump start it because we don't have any live power cells anymore. But over here, we have a system where a ship can fly in over here, it can park, it can unload massive quantities of matter in its fluid form, which can then be put into this machine here, the matter assembler, which will then take that, but it will put the matter into the empty singularity fuel cells and spit out charged singularity fuel cells. In theory, those will then go down here around the belt, they'll be picked up by the, by the reactors down here, and then the empty ones will get put back out onto the belt, they'll come back up here, they'll go into the machine, and they'll get refilled. Now, that is going to work, we just need a lot more of the uh, fuel, uh, of the singularity fuel cells in the in the system because each one of these will grab about five full ones if it can before it'll stop picking them up and so we need to have at least 30 of them over here just to make sure that all the machines can grab them when they want now we could go and put in some sort of clever system where we we load one in every time we unload one and Yes, that would probably work, but that sort of system tends to be very, very fragile. And if you do have a power problem, it's a massive faff to get everything up and running again. It's much easier just to have plenty of them and just accept that we're probably going to waste some power. Maybe we'll have a system where we can we can actually just turn all of these off when we don't when we don't need them. I don't know. Mark is is always organising this area, and he tends to be quite organised about this sort of thing. So we'll we'll see what he wants to do, how he wants to set it up. But in short, the system theoretically works, but it's a little bit ropey at the moment, and it needs a little bit. More more work before we can call it actually finished. In order to get the supplies out there that we need, Marcus also built another deep space ship. This one is called the Fenestra um, because that's where it goes. It doesn't look like it's well. It actually, it might maybe it has been set up with automation. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but the point, but the point of this ship, well, it's got a singularity reactor on it because, well, why not? Basically, although that's going to run out of fuel fairly soon because, like most reactors, these seem to just burn through their fuel cells even when they're not doing anything. Um, but it's got a machine up here to reload them, and it can do it from its own tanks up here, which in theory means it will have plenty of fuel and be able to just keep going. Basically basically forever. In practice, um, I th if you just leave it sitting for too long, then it's going to burn through all of its fuel cells, and especially if it's on its way back so these tanks are empty, it's then going to run out. So we're going to need to keep a little bit of an eye on it. But it does, it basically works, we've got the ion engines at the back, got uh, reactors to keep them fueled, and then up here we've got these tanks which we can put the matter into that we want to bring out to feed into the into the system up here, to feed through and, and power everything. And so this ship is going to be able to fly back and forth between Norvis Orbit and Fenestra and make sure we always have a, a healthy supply of matter available. A new ship does of course mean we need a new spaceport for it to park in, so that's what we've got here. Uh, as you can see the ship can, uh, can drop into the nice, nicely uh, shaped cutout here. It's a slightly different shape from the rest of them, but that's because it's got more engines across the back to allow it to go a bit quicker because you know we're in, we're always in a bit of a hurry with this sort of thing and then it's loaded up with ion stream as usual and then the matter is pumped in along this pipe here fills up the tanks and then the tanks can be dumped straight over into the ship very quickly and easily presumably this pipe goes back to another station over here yes so we have a train coming up bringing the matter up from the ground now each one of these trains will hold 60,000 matter each of these tanks holds 200,000 matter so that means we need 10 trains to come up in order to fill up the spaceship uh, that's quite a lot however it's clearly working because we have a train here full uh, and we have a train here and all of the tanks are full so clearly we are able to bring enough of that up um, I'm surprised it's keeping up but it but it seems to be working so uh, definitely no complaint there and down on the ground we of course have a handover area where a train can come in bringing a load of, of matter over from where it's produced and dumping it into into a space train over here that can take it up and then load more up into space and this helps to show uh, helps to explain why we seem to have plenty of matter the fact that there's uh, two trains do it apparently two trains doing the uh, the route it does sort of explain it somewhat and looking over here where we're actually producing the matter you can see that most of these tanks have emptied quite quickly in fact these are all basically empty uh, there's just little, little amounts of work there's a couple of thousand in there but basically all the tanks are pretty empty and we're still struggling to fill up this train so the rate we're producing the matter at at the moment is insufficient to keep up with the demands. We've got a nice steady flow of um, copper ore coming in here and a slightly bursty flow of iron ore coming in. Um, however, it's not quite enough as you can see. We're not processing it quite quickly enough down here. As you can see, some of this iron ore is still getting turned into landfill. And we don't really need landfill. 
So it would be better if we could start just turn, if we could run this a little bit faster. And that probably means putting tier 6 speed modules in here instead of the tier 3s we've got at the moment to match this one. Because this one clearly can keep up, this one can't. Let's upgrade this one to the point where it can. I think that should help a lot. We do also have a lot of other resources just generally available because we're bringing over massive quantities of stone and iron ore from other planets. So those are being stacked up here. We could potentially start pulling this away and using it to make matter. Um, and at the moment we, we seem to, well, we, we seem to have quite a lot of stone being used at the moment. We're currently filling up a train over here. So maybe it'd be better to use all of the excess stone we have for uh, producing more matter rather than turning it all into um, into stone to carpet the base as Mark has been doing over here. Um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how we feel about that. But it is definitely something we could do with a bit more of it over here. And we are, and the machine that's turning stone into matter is running most of the time. So we do have a decent amount coming through there. But it could always be improved a little bit further. And if we have a look at the production graph over the last 10 hours, because that's about as long as we've been, we've been using matter for, you can see that we've produced about 3 million of it, and we've used 1 million of it. So there's quite a lot still in the tanks, and these are the tanks that are up in the uh, up in the in Finestra, the tanks that are up in the space station, and so on. All those ones that are storing a certain amount of it. Uh, so we've got quite a lot. We've got quite a lot of it stockpiled still in places, but we we aren't producing, we aren't replenishing it fa as fast as we're using it, or at least it doesn't feel that way, especially given that the spaceship is now virtually back and ready to fill up with some more matter to take back over to Finestra to fill up the tanks over there again. And if we look over the last hour, we can see that we've been producing the matter at 2.7 thousand per minute and using it at 3.8 thousand per minute. Uh, that's obviously not going to be sustainable, so we're going to have we're going to struggle a bit here. So we're going to need to upgrade the matter production somehow. Exactly how we do that, exactly what we decide we want to sacrifice to the hungry, hungry more of the matter generators, well, we'll have to see. But I think it's going to be a lot of iron ore from Oliran and maybe a lot of stone from Andragon. Just pump those directly into the into the machines and just get get the matter out the other side just to keep everything running. We could even consider making matter on Oliran or um, Andragon and shipping it from there, but I suspect that's just going to make the uh, make maybe it's going to create some headaches and, and difficulties with with transporting it around. Of course, getting all of this running meant we needed a few extra things to be made. So over here on the Tower of Construction, Mark has finished off producing the um, the thing Singularity fuel cells, and he's brought in as I was saying last week, he's brought in the nitric acid in barrel form. It's being unbarreled here and shoved into the into the machines, and he's replaced the uh, the belt I spotted last week that came all the way over here and down the other side with this one that can join onto the one further down so that's that's quite nice i think it's it makes sense to just have the one belt over here for getting rid of scrap and uh, other other waste products He's also started doing the matter assembler productions. I think I think that's these things. Yes, matter assemblers. And these are the things that take the matter and put it into the fuel cells. So we obviously need these as well. And they're, they, they look like they've not been too difficult to make. Most of the stuff is coming in by belt, except for these catalogs that are coming in by bot. And I'm... I'm okay with catalogs being transported around by bot. They're such a sort of a... They're used in relatively small quantities and they are expensive to make. So I think having them brought over like that is absolutely fine. But all the rest of it can just flow in nicely around here. So that's work... And that's working well. We're producing we're producing these, as you saw, out in uh, Fenestra. We've got a load of these in place. And yeah, it's all working nicely. The next thing on the list is further pyramid hunting. So this time we're going to talk about Mike instead of Mark. He's been off with the uh, with the Caladrian, the long range combat vessel, flying off, and he took it off to the Erione system. And I'm almost certain he's going to have gone via um, Fenestra for that to take the uh, the useful shortcut. And over in the Erione system, well, there's uh, there's quite a few planets out here. It looks like he's been launching uh, satellites to to, uh, to explore the place as well. But over here, the ones we're actually interested in are Metapilla here, Aeolus up here and Chorus right at the top, because those are the ones that have pyramids on them. You can see, there we go, click on it, there's a pyramid flag there. So uh, Mike has gone in, he's cleared out all three of these planets, and the, well, he's not cleared out the planets, he's cleared out the pyramids, and he's taken the, uh, the, the, the modules from them, and more importantly, he's taken screenshots of the cartouches inside the pyramids. And that brings us up to a total of 16 pyramids we've explored now, and you can see all of their uh, cartouches arranged across here, and they are deliberately clumped together. And if I turn these lines on, you can see why. Each one, each one of these lines represents two cartouches that have been joined, that are joined because they have matching symbols on them. So the center symbol of one cartouche max, matches an edge symbol of another one, and vice versa. They're always reciprocal. And so we've got this, this nice cluster going on over here on the left-hand side, where, uh, with, with loads of them bundled around chorus. So we've now got five of the eleven around Chorus that have, have been discovered and are now and are represented by the uh, by on, on the on the uh, on the diagram here. So th there's still clearly more exploration to do, but Chorus is is clearly at the centre of all of those ones, and that means we've been able to join lots and lots of these together. I'm sort of cautiously optimistic that as we carry on discovering more and more of them, eventually every single one will join together in a clump 
and it'll be a, and it, I'm expecting it to be a sort of a sphere as well, so I'm going to have to find a different way to draw it, and I've no idea what that way is going to be. It's probably going to be beyond my um, graphical design capabilities, but this is the basic idea that we're working towards. We reckon that we're going to, we're going to see all of these sort of form up into a giant sphere, and then we're going to be able to work out something from that. We're not quite sure what yet. We are also aware of the, uh, the symbols on the bottom parts of the cartouches with the triangles. Uh, Tristan's done a little bit of playing around with those and he reckons they can be put together like a jigsaw puzzle. I've not actually played with that myself yet because I haven't had the time. Uh, however, at some point I will do so and then report back to you and let you know what I've found and maybe we'll be able to sort of just squish them all together and make some sort of nice neat shape out of it and, and maybe that will mean something. We've also been continuing with the star mappings, we've done an extra... Um, two I think in the last streams so we've got up to 17 of them so far apparently and we still haven't seen any overlap between the symbols seen here in the for the star mappings and the symbols in the centers of the cartouches that said we have seen overlaps between these symbols and the symbols around the edges of the cartouche we've, we've seen a few a few matches along there and so we reckon that we're def we're um we're getting closer we it's like it started we've started exploring with the cartouches on one side of the sphere and the star mappings on the other side of the sphere. So hopefully eventually they'll start to, they'll, they'll meet and then they'll sort of start to cross over and we'll see a lot of um, matches between them. And then maybe we can start to use some of the uh, coordinates we're seeing over here to tell us something interesting and useful about the uh, about the symbols and the shapes and the and everything we know about the, the cartouches. And from there, Hopefully we'll be able to work out some way of programming the Stargate appropriately. Um, because as we've said, all the symbols we're finding match the ones that we're seeing when we turn on the Stargate. So they, the, uh, the symbols that flow around the outside match these ones in here in, inside the star mapping. And also the ones we're seeing in the cartouches as well. So there's definitely some, um, there's definitely a connection here. Definitely some sort of link. But it's going to be a little while until we, uh, until we can be any more sure about it than that. Doing all this long-range star mapping has meant we've been ripping through absolutely phenomenal quantities of the um, astro data. So if we look at this one here, you can see this, this, unlike most researchers, so if we look at mining productivity, for example, it takes, yes, it takes a deep space science pack, it take, and it takes a biological science pack, it's number four, sure. Uh, but normally, each research will only take one type of one of each type of science. So this one takes one energy and one deep space. This one takes one astro, one energy, one material, and one deep space. So you can see they're all, they all use one tier of each type of research. Uh, if we look at some of the more advanced ones down here, this one takes this one takes Deep Space 2 and Bio 4. This one, the absolute final, the Spaceship Victory takes all of them and they're all at tier 4, but it doesn't, but it only takes one tier of each type of research. The long range star mappings take all four tiers of the astro science. So that means when you're doing them, you're absolutely hammering your astro uh, science production system. And so down here, it was struggling to keep up we have, for, for, for a number of reasons. But one of which is that in order to make each of the um, e each tier of science requires the previous one. So in order to make a tier four science pack, you need a tier three science pack. To make a tier three science pack, you need a tier two. To make a tier two, you need a tier one. So in order to get all of them, that means you need a tier four, you need two tier threes, three tier twos, and four tier ones. So it's putting really heavy load on the on the lower um, levels over here, and that means you're pulling through massive, massive quantities of all of the intermediates, and also requiring these machines to run really, really quickly. Which is why we've got some speed modules in over here, and then why we're short of intermediates over here, uh, which I shall talk about a little bit more as we as we go sort of further up that chain, shall we say. And so because of that, we've been sort of alternating back and forth between doing a, a long range star mapping research and then a something else research. This one just uses matter. At to and, and advance to. Uh, then we do another one to, to, to use up some more astro. Then we do this one, which, which uses biological and so on. So we're alternating back and forth because we need to do a lot of long range star mappings, but we also have a, f a few other things that we want to research. And in order to help the system keep up when it kicks over and in, back into the, doing the astro, we've got some storage containers up here now where we're putting in each of the um, each of the types of astro data. So, so we've got a nice stockpile of them in here, and these are going to run whenever there's less than probably 5,000 or something like that. Uh, yes, whenever there's less than 5,000 of that particular type of science in the chest they'll run and, lo and load it up until it gets to the until it gets the required amount now you'll notice that over here we seem to have run out of tier 3 and tier 4 and if we follow this belt down we're also a bit short of the tier 2s and actually the tier 1s as well so if we have a look over here we can start to investigate why now i'm not sure why the tier 1s aren't running oh, the tier 1s are running we're not actually short of those i misread the belt the tier 2s are struggling because there aren't enough beryllium sticks coming in they should be flowing in down here they're brought up by a train and they come in here but the problem is you require 40 of them for every single science pack, or at least every single time you run the science pack uh, production. Uh, and, the, and the belt along here was struggling to keep up, so we've upgraded this one to a deep space belt to double the amount of throughput available. And even then, it's still a bit of a struggle, um, but it's, it's, it's doing reasonably well, at least when we have some. 
The tier threes are also struggling, partly because of the lack of tier twos, but also because we've ripped through all of the uh, beryllium scaffolds that, uh, that these ones take in order to do as their intermediate. These numbers are a little bit less ridiculous. Actually, no, they take about these are still pretty ridiculous because it's thirty, and this is a more complicated thing that's needed as well. So yeah, you can see why we've been ripping through massive, massive quantities of these, and why it's being a bit of a struggle down on the ground in the intermediates production area. Yeah, we had we had this area over here that was producing the beryllium sticks. We've got a couple of machines there. We've got three machines around here, all producing them off this one machine over here making the sticks uh, and then another four machines down here that were making them in order for it to be turned into other things but we've now I've now linked all of these up by belts so we've now got as many as but all all of the overflow if possible will flow up here to go into the station and actually we seem to have quite a lot here so I'm not sure why that train's just sitting there probably oh probably because we've run out of um no we've got a decent number of scaffolds as well Oh, not enough to fill a train up, though. That's probably why it's a scaffolding problem. So we've run out. We've run out of those as well, um, just because we've run out. Yeah, we've run out of beryllium sticks to make into them, and we've just run out of beryllium in general to make more beryllium sticks. Because yeah, as as I've been saying and sort of hinting at for the last few uh, videos, our beryllium production is struggling a little bit. And I'll come back to that in a moment, because part of the reason it's struggling is because this area over here wasn't producing them fast enough. So I've doubled it. I've taken a copy of basically the whole area that's making the sticks and the and the uh, the scaffolds. And also I thought I might as well do the, the bulkheads as well, just because. Uh, why not? We've got plenty of them, but just in case the productive requirements for those go up in the future. And so we've now got almost twice as many of the uh, beryllium sticks being produced. I was going to say that they're all being fed through onto the belts over here to be, to be added onto the ones that are going up there, but they're not. Um, they're all actually just being made into the into the scaffolds that they're being passed through here. So, um, yeah, if we ever have enough scaffolds, then this, these belts are going to overflow. And to be honest, this should be feeding them through and should get onto the belt up here as well, just in case that's what runs out. So that's not been built quite the way I intended it to, but but never mind. The uh, system should, in theory, basically, it'll still mean we're making a lot more of the scaffolds, which is, is still valuable. You saw that we'd run out of those as well. However, yes, we've run out of beryllium. And we've run out of beryllium simply because over on Talos, we're not able to make it quickly enough. We've got the system up at the top here that is bringing in a decent amount of the core chunks, which we're then processing through, but then there aren't enough mines digging them up for the trains to depart immediately, so we need, we need more mines over here. The processing system here is it's working. Uh, it could be better. We could have better productivity modules. Actually, no, the productivity modules are pretty good. We could have better beacons in here to make it run a bit faster. We could have better productivity. We could improve all of this all the way through. So I've, I've spent a little bit of time designing a new um, system that can be dropped in to replace this one, uh, but I haven't had a chance to put it in yet. We, we're not quite at that stage yet, well, I'll do, uh, but I'll do that, do that in the next stream. I will also need to put in a lot more core mining drills in order to keep the uh, core chunks flowing, in order to keep all of this happy. And I might extend these trains to be a bit longer as well. Well, because they're just not bringing in enough. Similarly, I kind of want to extend the trains down here a bit and have more of, and have them bringing in more uh, more barrel at a time, and probably and, and have more mines as well because we've got a train sitting here at the front that can't go anywhere. So there is a lot of upgrading needed over here. This system is still so it's still only on about probably tier two of how of where these of, of the upgrades of these systems. It needs to be brought up to tier three, so it'll work a bit faster and we'll have enough beryllium. In order to at least try and help with the uh, with the beryllium problem up in the, in the in the space station, I've added in an additional one of these trains, and these are the ones that bring the uh, bring all the beryllium products from the ground up to the uh, up to the science area in the space station. And I've also tweaked the proportions in here, so you can see there's a few more beryllium sticks than there used to be. And then we've got another train over here. This one's come back down again and is now blocking one of the stations over here. So I'm um, sorry about that, but uh, I don't know. What, but it had to go somewhere. Perhaps I should put in another waiting station. Uh, and this one, as you can see, has got through. It's unloaded a huge number of its beryllium sticks, but it's also got rid of all of its um, aeroframe scaffolds. So perhaps the balance is still a little bit out. There should be a few more scaffolds being brought up for the number of sticks. However, the big problem here isn't so much the um, what comes back down in the train. The problem is mostly just the shortages of beryllium down here in order to actually make more of everything we need. Now I do see quite a lot of scaffolds here and quite a lot of sticks. So why are you not going? You seem to be completely full. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for a full cargo inventory, which you seem to have. Nope, there's a few, there's six ingots missing in this train here over here. Six beryllium ingots, and that's the reason it's not going. Well, I guess I could send this what this one off. You can go, it can go up, um, and then the uh, the other one can come in and at least start filling up with some of the products, and it'll get it out of the station over here. But then the other one will come back down once it's unloaded, so it won't actually help very much. And then this one isn't going to be able to go anywhere because this is short of 90, uh, 96 beryllium ingots in there and 50, 56 in there. So yeah, there's there's a bit of the intermediates are available, but we are very very short of the iridium ingots here, and just just generally we we don't have as much of the beryllium as we actually need in order to keep the system running nicely over here. 
Having put in a second train doing that run, I also need to now have a, a somewhere for it to sit when things are idle, either both up in space and on the ground. So this is the one it can sit in when it's in space. So a train will pull in here and then it will wait for this station to be free before it trundles around and, come, and, and comes in over here. So when we actually have enough, in theory, there'll be one train sat in here unloading and one train in here waiting to go and unload. When there's a problem, there will be one train sat in the station down on the ground trying to load and struggling, and the other train will be sat down sat down on the, on the ground in one of the unloading stations uh, not doing anything. And so you can see this isn't working quite as I would like it to, but that's because we've run out of the beryllium, yada yada yada. The other problem we had with the Astro was we, because we're doing so much of it, we're getting through the um, getting through the insights rather too quickly because, well, when with all four of these running, we're using a lot more insights than we normally would. So we're starting to see problems with those. That was an easy problem to fix, though. I've just shoved speed modules into all these supercomputers down here and then started unloading onto both sides of the belt. And as you can see, things are now absolutely fine. We have plenty of uh, insights along here. This is working as I would like it to. It, it's great. We have, we have a, a plentiful supply. And as a final note, over on Talos, I've also moved the beryllium hydroxide production for Naquium from having two machines over here, which this one's still sat there because, okay, it has now finished unloading, so we can, uh, I, can I can demolish it, over to here uh, and move, put these two machines in over here. And that meant I had to move the, um, the sulfuric acid pipe down a bit in order to bring it round like, nicely like that. Uh, and then we've got the, and then I have a beryllium hydroxide pipe running across the top here to take it away again. But that's all fine, that was relatively easy. And this now means that we've got, we're now producing this underneath the uh, wide area beacon here, which means these machines run much more quickly, which means they don't need to have speed modules in them, which means I can I can put productivity modules in them, meaning that they're now a lot more efficient, which means they use a lot less of the barrel ore that's coming in over here in order to make enough beryllium hydroxide to keep the system happy. As you can see, we've got I've got a prioritization down here to make sure that it never runs out, but at the moment it's just not using any, we've filled the pipes up. And this machine has finally finished unloading the beryllium hydroxide. It's still got a load of cryonite in it, which is a shame. But it means it's now ready to be removed like that. And that means I can now get rid of this bit over here as well. All of this can now be removed and just gen generally do a little bit of a tidy up. And I think this is probably quite a good place to work to call a cut in the video. I've, um... I've, I've, I've covered the well. I've covered all the new, weird, experimental, uh, puzzle-related stuff, and I've talked quite a bit about how we're uh, struggling a little bit with the beryllium and what that's meant for astro science. So next time I shall be talking about all the other resources we've got running and how uh, how things are going with those, um, and all the sort of the little uh, tweaks and tinkerings that have gone on around the uh, factory to make sure everything carries on working nicely. And so we should be back on Monday to do a bit more work on this factory during the stream where I should be coming and try and get the uh, beryllium production under control because that's currently the biggest problem, I think. Uh, Mark is going to carry on with the uh, Stargate and Mike will probably carry on going around poking at pyramids and getting as valuable insights and modules from those. So definitely come along then. Should be a good fun stream as always. So uh, um, yeah, make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you then. Thanks for watching and goodbye.